need coaching in this context, virtually, mm -hmm. in across cultures. I need it where it's done in 15 minutes rather than one hour. My guest today is Ben Kier, a regional leader in the Asia Pacific region at GP Strategies. Ben, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for being on the show. Great to be here, Jeremy. Thanks for having me, mate. So our topic for this episode is how to design engaging hybrid learning experiences, which to me implies that learning programs or modules are typically not engaging, not naturally engaging, that the engagement doesn't just kind of magically happen. And then instead, you have to actually design hybrid learning mm. with from the start with the goal of, active, of, of actively engaging learners. So that might seem obvious, but maybe for some mm. listeners, it's not so obvious. So why is that? Well, it's an interesting premise to start with, Jeremy. Um, let's start by kind of getting a common definition of what I'm referring to in this podcast. So I don't get any kind of angry messages from someone disagreeing, you know, what, what, what we're talking about or what I'm talking about with hybrid learning is really I'm talking about, I'm not talking about a classroom training with a, a, an online portal at the end or an e-learning followed by a virtual session. I'm really talking about a modern learning experience, which typically has a few characteristics. You know, number one, they're spaced and somewhat continuous. They might extend over a number of weeks or months or forever. Um, they might include, they should include a blend of modalities. A, a, this is hence the word hybrid. And, and the hybrid modalities are truly blended. You know, a good, a good metaphor I like to use is a lot of people think of blended learning and especially learners. And they think of a salad where you can see all the different pieces. And, you know, I might not like the olives, but I'm going to eat the tomatoes. And there's like a bit of a pick and choose, you know, like a, we have a lot of my customers and a lot of my experience in the last 20 years in Asia has been, you know, client, uh, learners choose not to do the pre-work, but they do come to the classroom part, you know? Mm. So they have this kind of pick and choose blend. But really, the better m image to have in your mind with hybrid learning is like a smoothie. It's all one thing, right? Whether it's I'm watching a video on a Tuesday, I'm attending a virtual session on a Friday, I'm reading an article, I'm participating in some sort of a social forum. It's one singular experience. So that's what we talk about when we talk about hybrid learning. And there's one other characteristic that I want to stress that is different from, uh, I would say, like company-led learning, which is modern hybrid learning is learner-driven. So hmm. in a classroom, you have a facilitator who is kind of guiding you through it. You have an LMS system saying, be here at this time and this day and we'll mm -hmm. lock the door when you're in. And then it's the facilitator's job to engage you. And we hope that there's magic that happens when you go back to work. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about where I'm continuously learning the responsibility. The onus is on me as a learner to participate. And to be frank, it's an important topic because, <clears throat> you know, the world is changing. You know, we need to reskill the entire workforce. And, and, and traditionally, learning budgets, budgets have been allocated to um, especially around soft skills like leadership development to our top talent or to our senior leaders or to the few rather than the many, you know? And so it's a really important topic of how we can deploy hybrid learning to reach the masses without reducing effectiveness. And so a central piece to that is engagement. A long walk there and I'm back to engagement. I promised you mm -hmm. I'd get back there. When we talk about engagement, because it's self-led, because it's spaced over time, it is not inherently engaging. And, and the metaphor I'd like to use is this, and maybe Jeremy, I can engage you in a little bit of a, a thought experiment. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. You're gonna sure. play along with me here. So imagine you're at home, right? It's, 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 it's the evening and you've decided for whatever reason that you wanna make a baked chocolate cheesecake, mm. right? You don't know how to okay. do that, but you wanna make one. What do you do? Well. I mean, I'm lactose intolerant, I must admit. So that, so I'd probably first. Well, that's important. Lactose, Let's but... throw that in there. It's a unique characteristic. But where okay, would you go so to I find that information? Go to Google. I'd Google it and maybe YouTube it. You know, how to right. make this kind of cake. And that's and fascinating. I love that you added in that extra layer in there, which is how do I make a baked chocolate cheesecake for someone who is lactose intolerant? You've got that extra layer of complexity that's unique yeah. to you. And, and so you would go on, as we all would, we'd go on Google or we'd go on YouTube and then we'd see results, 
So imagine these results have come up and, you know, two of the results are just a chocolate cheesecake, not a baked chocolate cheesecake. Are we going to look at those results? Probably not because I want a baked chocolate cheesecake, right? And then you've got three more results and all of them are a baked chocolate cheesecake, but only one of them is a lactose intolerant kind of baked chocolate cheesecake. You know, so you're going to go to the one and you're going to ignore everything else that that you're seeing right and then when you go into that there might be a couple of different videos you can watch one of them is a two hour video and one of them is six 90 second videos which mm. one do you want to go to jeremy which one lends itself most to your learning style it's got to be the six 90 second videos right i mean right. i don't have two hours to learn how to i'm just if it if the only option is two hours i'm just not going to make the cake yeah, you, you've got it right. And so what we've just done there and what all of us do every day is we demonstrate modern learning behavior, which is that in order for something to be engaging, it's not just about gamification. The first layer of of engagement is relevance and alignment, right? So your version of a, of a baked chocolate cheesecake for lactose intolerant is my version of a, I want to learn how to do coaching but this is just a video that I found maybe on LinkedIn learning on coaching generally. But where is my version of my, I need a lactose intolerant baked chocolate cheesecake. I need something very specific. I need coaching in this context, virtually mm -hmm. in, across cultures because I'm working in Asia. You know, I need it where it's done in 15 minutes rather than one hour. I don't use the grow model. I use a different model. So really in the first way to drive engagement is relevance and the reality is jeremy that just because you've put a program together doesn't mean that you've achieved relevance and so this is why design is more important than delivery when it comes to hybrid learning because if we don't build it in with a ruthless layer of relevance and understanding what people are looking for then straight away before you even get mm -hmm. to gamification and those other tools you've you've lost you have to do a lot of work then to make that engaging. You have to then all of a sudden start to push people through it. Come on, go and click on it, go and watch it. And people are like, I don't really want to. It's not really what I'm looking for. And so mm -hmm. you land in this position. And so, yeah, they're not inherently engaging unless you design it. If the main criteria of engagement is relevance, <clears throat> then in order to know what is going to be relevant, you have to start with the end user, namely with the learner, and really start there and ask mm -hmm. yourself, what is going to be relevant to the people who I want to engage with this piece of material? I work with a lot of organizations, right? And a, and a lot of different levels of learning maturity in those organizations. But I think a consistent challenge or I'd say a gap in thinking that I come across, um, and even though a lot of companies would say, no, we get it, we get it. <clears throat> but then I don't necessarily see it reflected in the decisions. At the center of decisions is that if I put content in the center, or I put technology in the center of my decisions, there's an assumption that if I get the right tool, everyone's searching for like, if I could use a Lord of the Ring reference, the, the one ring to rule them all. They're looking for this one magic platform and one magic piece of content from an amazing provider. I want to get the Harvard you know, business school bit and I'm going to put that together in the one ring to rule them all and everyone's going to love it. That is, that's an incorrect assumption. Really what's at the center is the learner. And that comes before I even decide on what content I want to teach. Because when you put the learner in the center, let's use, go back to our chocolate cheesecake example. I could go out and design a whole training and throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at it. And then I launch it and it turns out 30% of my audience don't eat baked, baked chocolate cheesecakes because they're lactose intolerant. <laughs> if I had have discovered that at first, that not only would have changed my design potentially, but it would have changed the content that I was initially intending to roll out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. And I mean, let's not forget in the Lord of the Rings, the one ring to rule them all had to be destroyed at the end because it was, it was bad. It was sort of an evil ring that destroyed anyone <laughs> who touched it. <laughs> yeah. I've always often wondered if I'd passed the test of, of if I could give up the ring, <laughs> but um, just letting a bit of my geekdom out there. But, um, you know, it is true. You know, I, I think that there is almost a poison chalice dimension to looking for this one technology. And I th I'd say it's some, in some respects, it's part of the technology providers marketing. It's, there's a fault there in the marketing because I, I, 
Mm. We help, GP Strategies helps clients vet the market. You know, often clients will come to us and say, can you run an, an RFP for us? Can you run some sort of a project to go and find us this learning solution, please? Go out to market and, and assess it and, and whatnot. And a lot of technology companies, and there's a, a lot of amazing ones out there, but they'll tell you they can do almost everything. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and but the reality is whether it's an LMS or an L, a learning a, a learning experience platform or whatever the technology may be, they're usually very strong at the core then kind of slightly good to the left and right of that and then get less good at something pretty dramatically quickly as you move outside those core features or that core use use case. Um, and so I think, you know, what ends up happening is is a lot of businesses, both for the desire of simplicity, for budget, but also because what, what they're being told, they're looking for this one solution. And, and in reality, mm -hmm. the future of, of learning is really more like your mobile phone. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got an app for banking and I go to that for banking. I've got an app for tracking my weight and fitness. I go to that. I don't go to that weight and fitness app for my banking, you know? Um, so you have apps for different things. So it's really the appification of learning that I think is something that it would be great if organizations got their head around that I'm going to be turning on and off tool sets in mm -hmm. my ecosystem to meet certain needs, right? These senior leaders need this. They need something very specific. These guys need something else. I need to hit 10,000 learners. That's a different thing, you know? So I think that's probably where it's mm -hmm. going. If, if learners, if, if companies can get their head around that, they'll make better technology decisions. Um, but at the same time, I want to stress here that technology is not at the center. It's your learners. And then secondarily to that, also your business. Mm -hmm. What is the culture today? What is the culture we want tomorrow? What are the goals? Those two things together then drive technology and content decisions. And you're going to be more likely to end up with an engaging experience if you do it in that order. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a phrase you used earlier was that this is, this is the kind of learning that's learner driven. Right. Meaning that it's not learners sort of passively waiting to be told what to learn, where to learn, how to learn, but rather as they need the learning to present them with options to say, OK, here's a slate of tools that you can mm. use to search for what you need to learn when you need it in. And then the content has to align with their needs and their styles of learning and so on. So, I mean, given that this, what we're talking about is really learner centric, right? The learner driving everything. Learner centricity. Yep. Yeah. How, what are the best ways that an organization can go about getting to know their learners so that they really understand mm. their needs and can use that information to drive the design? How do you do that? Look, it's a good question. <clears throat> and look, I hate to say this answer because it's, it's perceived as a buzzword and I've even had some of our customers kind of roll their eyes at me, but it's design thinking, you know, I mean, it is going in, you know, there's an art to being good at the, em uh, uh, just in case any, any listeners aren't really clear on the layers of design thinking, it starts with empathize, define, you know, ideate, prototype, test, you move through this process. It's an agile process. It's not linear. I might jump backwards and forwards. Um, depending on different inputs and outputs from the different stages. But in that empathy phase, um, what we use it for as a design tool is we build out learner personas. So I, I, I've recently um, moved through a learner personification process where we were trying to address a population of 4,000 learners, individual contributors um, at, a, at an engineering company. And that we were able to distill that down to six learner personas. Right. And so these learner personas should kind of represent the the points of a compass for that population, like the most extreme versions of each that group. Right. Like maybe a more senior person is very settled, isn't very ambitious and someone not looking to get their next promotion, very happy where they are. Maybe it's the inverse of that is someone who's, you know, hungry and very ambitious and really driven for that. And, and so what you want to understand here isn't just their training needs analysis, because to be frank, you know, I, I love this story, and I don't know if it's a real story, but you know, Henry Ford apparently was quoted saying, "If I asked people what they wanted before I released the car, they'd say I want a faster horse." You know, <laughs> and I love that quote because you don't necessarily know the learning that you need, especially if we're talking about future of learning and dealing with disruptions which haven't come yet. You know, so um, so you understand those learners' needs, of course, but what's their environment like? What access do they have to, to, to technology? What, what are their schedules like? What do they think and feel when you say digital learning? Some people have a, a, 
a revulsion. They feel uncomfortable mm-hmm. about it because their previous experience with, with, with digital were mandatory 30, 45 minute really dry e-learnings, you know? And so you've got to understand those dynamics and then that feeds into your design process and you make decisions not just about the content, but also about how much time, how many minutes should each interaction be? How much can I expect them to achieve in a week of learning or in a month of learning? How do we engage them? You know, all of those different questions come through. So I'd really suggest that empathy process, but not just empathizing with the learner, empathize with the business. Because change management is another layer to consider when considering engagement. What If the current culture, as I just alluded to, of a business, the learning culture is traditional, top-down, we're waiting to be told, most of the learning we receive is mandatory, what the company wants us to do, and all of a sudden you're pivoting to this whole new approach to learning, and it's, 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 it's for you, it's an investment in you, it's to help you reskill and be ready for the future, there's going to be resistance there. So you've got to build that change management into your marketing communication, into even the pro, the way you launch the program and the modules themselves. You know, so so there's a mm-hmm. lot that goes into engagement. And to just yeah. to summarize that answer to your question, it's all about that. The design thinking process is, is effective because it gets you that learner insight at the right at the start. When you do get it right, what do you stand to gain? Mm. Well, I, I think the advantages are huge. Um, Another interesting dynamic that I see, which is, it, it's, it's actually an advantage, is a lot of people somehow think, especially when it comes to professional development and leadership development, more soft skills, which are the future of work, right? Technical skills, some of them are dropping away through automation and an increase in high cognitive skills and social skills are the, the mm-hmm. going to be the new focus. That's what the data suggests, you know, from McKinsey and whatnot. So according to McKinsey, which is which, which and, and a bunch of other research which is pointed to this increase in social skills and and higher cognitive skills there's this fear that oh if we do digital it's like a, a sacrifice the real way we've got to do it is when COVID ends we're going back we're going back to putting everything into a classroom you know and, and so there's this impression that you need that trainer in the room but it's actually scientifically against learning sciences so if you, there's a cognitive load theory is all about the human mind can only take on so much at any given time. And so when you mm-hmm. put people in a classroom and you give them two days of learning or you put people through three hours of e-learning or you try to take a, virtu- a classroom training and cram it into eight hours of virtual, there's a point at which learners can only take on so much. So the, the advantages of hybrid learning, if you design it well, is that the learning retention and the far transfer, the transfer of knowledge into other areas and the application of knowledge onto the job is much, much greater because you're spacing it over the time. Over time, Learners have the ability to consume something, a small bit of something. And if you've built it right, there's a powerful why behind it. They're motivated by it. It's ruthlessly relevant to them. Then you're giving them time to actually go and take that back to the job to take that action before you flood them with something else, you know? So by spacing your learning out and making it learner centric by, by making it about them, giving them a powerful why I should care about this and then layering in those other pieces of gamification and, and those other elements that drive the the pool of engagement, you're going to get better retention. You're going to get better learning outcomes and probably more measurable because you've got technology there, which is tracking competence across the whole stream. So, so I'd say one of the number one benefits of well-designed hybrid learning is that you get retention and transfer more than you get with traditional approaches to learning. Excellent. Well, that's a great takeaway for our listeners and I think a perfect place to wrap up. So Ben, thanks so much for your time and uh, for a really great conversation. Sure. This webinar is brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we can create a world where business excellence makes possibilities achievable. You can access more webinars or download additional resources at gpstrategies.com forward slash resource hyphen library.